really great to be here with you and um, to the people joining us on live stream. I really hope my parents figured it out at the Pioneer Nursing Home in Melbourne, Arkansas. <laughs> They're trying for the first time ever, but they'll get the recording eventually if they didn't figure it out today. And to my friends at the Rochester Church of Christ who gathered in Michigan, uh, there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. You can't really tell from far away, but you can feel it in the room. It's a sweet, sweet spirit. We often gather here in the Pepperdine community, uh, and there is such a spirit in the room. I want you to know that we gather here for chapel uh, on a regular basis, and just this year we had so many times when God was honored and God was working. Shane Claiborne was here and he was speaking and he had all the students turn and look, the, the curtains were open and they looked out the windows while, and out the doors while he gave them a charge to go and serve and have purpose in this world. We gathered here uh, on Christmas and uh, President Benton's band played. Let me tell you, when your president has a band, the students love you. President Benton is a student's president, and they don't call him Andy. They don't call him President Benton. He is AKB. They chant it, AKB, AKB. <laughs> it is so much fun, and um, that was a special moment this year. Just last Friday night, we gathered for the baccalaureate service here and uh, sent a whole new group of students out. So to those of you who uh, give to Pepperdine and support us in prayer. Your prayers are effective. Your, work, your money is being put to good use in this place. John and I are so thankful to be a part of the robust Christian mission of Pepperdine University. You can open, yes, thank you. You can open your Bibles to James chapter four, verse 11. And I'll be reading from that passage in just a few minutes. When I started preparing for this sermon, I had no idea what journey I would be on. I really didn't know a lot about James, and I didn't even know why it hasn't been studied that much in Protestant history. So a lot of James was new to me. And I have to tell you, I was surprised when our passage from James led me to do a little research on sitcoms, situation comedies, we think the old sitcoms are The Honeymooners, or Gilligan's Island, or Maxwell Smart, remember the cone of silence? But it turns out that even the ancient Greeks and Romans appreciated a good sitcom as far back as 400 years before Christ. It was in the works of playwrights like Plautus, and Terence, that the sitcom storyline we all know was born. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back again. It's the ancient equivalent of Sam and Diane and Ross and Rachel and Leonard and Penny. If you read these old plays, you find characters who will make you laugh just by the way they walk. Just, just picture an ancient Barney Fife or an ancient George Jefferson strutting across the stage in a toga. That existed in these old plays. The plays have these clumsy characters who walk across the stage carrying too many dishes. You know they're going to trip and fall and drop the whole pile, but that doesn't make it any less entertaining when they do exactly what you expected. Think of Lucille Ball in I Love Lucy. Now, people flocked to these plays. Sometimes thousands gathered around the stage on wooden benches. So those of you who braved the bleachers can imagine what that felt like, the comfort level of watching these plays. Now, part of the fun of the comedy experience was learning to recognize predictable characters in the play. They're called stock characters. Audiences knew to expect certain characters to show up, like a damsel in distress. They knew that a damsel in distress would come, and they knew what to expect from her, and then they knew how the storyline would go because of her. They knew to expect a clever servant 
They knew he would win out in the end. They knew to expect a superstitious man. Now, I want to zone in on one of these stock characters. Imagine we're in the audience at one of these plays, and when the play commences, a character walks onto the stage. The actor is a really, really good actor. So before he even says a word, simply by the way he holds himself by his body language, we know this guy. We already know him. We've seen stock characters like him before. He holds his nose a bit higher than necessary. He strikes a pose that's just too posy. He swaggers. We can tell just by the way he carries himself that he is in love with himself. Narcissists are as old as time. And when this character opens his mouth and speaks, our every instinct about who he is is confirmed. He boasts about his accomplishments. And with every word he utters, he pompously elevates himself. He has lines like these. It really is a plague to be as handsome as I am. Or he says, I've just come from battle where I slayed a hundred men, but I'm not tired. <laughs> this is the person who would have taken a selfie and posted it on social media, hashtag me. <laughs> the ancient Greeks and Romans called this stock character the Aladzon. A-L-A-Z-O-N, Aladzon. It's ancient Greek for, and this is my translation, big, fat, arrogant bragger. <laughs> now, the passage we're considering for our sermon today goes all the way from James 4.11, where we're going to start, to 5.6. When I realized that this Greek word, Aladzon, is part of today's passage, I just started seeing these arrogant narcissists parading around this text as if they were on a stage. James has these characters showing up, uh, this character showing up not once, but three times. The text has three main sections, so let's start with the first one. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of, a law, of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Now, here's the scene James evokes. Allah's own character, number one. When you say bad things about other people, you are using words to lower someone else and to elevate yourself. That's arrogant. It's like this. Instead of obeying the law like everybody should, you think you are in charge of the law. And even though you're not a judge, you have snuck into a courtroom, you have put on a judge's robe, and you have grabbed the judge's gavel. Imagine the audacity it would take to do that, to sneak into a courtroom and to take the judge's gavel. And the judge you've usurped is God. Who are you to usurp God? Who are you to judge your neighbor? All its own, character number one, exit, stage right, enter. All its own, character number two, stage left. Verse 11, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and we will do th this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. And that's where we get that root word, Allah's zone. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. In this section, James presents us with another arrogant character who comes into the scene swaggering and bragging about how much money he makes and how successful he is. 
James is not against honest business. He's against the suggestion that a businessman or businesswoman's whole identity would be wrapped up in making money with no regard for God or other people or where blessings really come from in the first place. He's not simply talking about how fast life goes when he says, life is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He has these arrogant traveling merchants, and they were common at that time, people who moved from place to place just to go find the next best place to make money and then to come back home bragging about it and showing off their wealth. He has these traveling merchants boastfully standing in the all zone posture, acting like they can grasp or hold on to mist when they are missed, it is a silly picture. It's, it's like a cartoon that you would see in the newspaper. Someone who is missed is trying to hold on to missed. James is being sarcastic here. He's saying it's arrogant, even comical, to act like we are in control when we are a missed and the Lord is the one in control, so stop embarrassing yourself. And now... All its own character number three, fasten your seatbelts. James really gets in our faces with this one. Chapter five, verse one. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be evidence against you and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up for yourselves, you have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous ones who do not resist you. This final all odds zone character is the most blatant and the most evil. This is some of the most vivid language in the New Testament. You can sense here the rhythms of the great social prophets like Micah, like Hosea. It's here in James 5, where we understand why James has been called the Amos of the New Covenant. He lets loose on rich people. James holds out a handful of coins to them and says, look at your coins. And in those days, people polished their coins to keep them from rusting. He says, your coins are rusting and there's nothing you can do about it. And then I think, I think James goes all science fiction on him. Look what he does next. He says, it's not just your coins that are decomposing. Look at yourselves. Your flesh is being eaten. Don't you think that sounds all science fiction? It's scary. By the time James gets done with these rich, arrogant, all its own people, they are no longer swaggering no longer boasting, no longer holding their noses high, James has them standing on a pile of stuff. Broken iPads, cracked Rolex watches, stained coach purses. There they are, broken, weeping, old and wrinkled, wearing nothing but an old sweater with moth-eaten holes in it. The plot proceeds as we expect. The pile of dishes falls. The olive zone, the bragger, the stock narcissist is always humbled. James knows what we all know. Pride comes before the fall. Commentaries and sermons on this passage dedicate long and many pages and words to the rich. A lot of work has been done to reframe or to soften or to recontextualize what James said. And the reason rich people attempt these interpretive backflips is because deep down, we rich all its own have an inner defensive impulse that wants to explain away our wealth, our 401ks, our financial portfolios, the luxury and pleasure that we enjoy. And if we can't do that, 
We want to soften the text so that we who are rich do not feel the punch in the gut quite the way James designed it. Reading this text is a vulnerable feeling. It leaves you brought down a step. The passage, however, is not ultimately about rich people and their sad, vulnerable state on Judgment Day. The text is about the poor people and their misery now. One preacher from a poor country said something that haunts me. He noticed how many sermons and commentaries written primarily by rich Western Christians are in defense of the rich, and he said, just, just leave it to the rich and arrogant to make James 5 about them instead of about the poor. Ouch. James emphatically says, listen, you're supposed to really stop and pay attention to what comes next when a writer says that. Listen, pay attention to know what the real center of this passage is. The cries of your laborers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. I can't help but hear that like, "Uh uh-oh, you're going to get in trouble In this statement, the original readers would have made a connection. He's referring to Leviticus 19.13. It expressly prohibits holding back a laborer's wage until the next morning. You see, laborers were worse off than slaves in those days because slaves at least could depend on food and shelter from their owners. But if day laborers didn't get paid on a day-to-day basis, they did not eat and their children did not eat. So James forces the rich all its own to step away from their regal dinner parties, go out on the balcony and listen. Listen to the cries of children going to bed hungry. I was on a flight a few weeks ago from LAX to St. Louis and two rows in front of me, a baby was crying really, really loud, shrieking. The parents of the baby tried everything to soothe her, but the baby cried louder and louder. We did not hear the exit plans in case of emergency. We did not hear the seatbelt instructions. It's interesting to watch people respond to a situation like that. Some people are very understanding. They've probably been in that situation before with their own children. Some people are not so understanding. The woman right in front of me, so she was just behind the crying baby, made a big show about how perturbed she was, and she eventually put on those big, oversized, noise-canceling headphones that look like, almost like a helmet. You know the ones I'm talking about. And at one point, you know how people sometimes yell when they have on headphones because they don't realize? (laughs) She yelled to her friend in the seat next to her, that baby is so loud, even noise-canceling headphones don't work. So, people on the baby's side gave her dirty looks, and people on her side gave nods of approval and rolled their eyes at this crying baby. Normally, I don't like to guess who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. (laughs) But this lady got me thinking that chances cannot be good for people who don't have compassion for the parents of crying babies on an airplane. Okay, this is the kind of cry James is talking about when he says, cries have reached the ears of the Lord. He's not referring to a quiet whimper, a quiet cry, easily soothed. This is a shriek. This is a persistent cry, a haunting cry, and there are no noise-canceling options for the rich. The word he uses to describe their cry is the same word that is used to describe the blood of Abel crying out for his murder. It's the same word that's used to describe the Hebrew slaves in Egypt crying out in their oppression. This is a serious word. Cries of murder victims, cries of slaves, cries because rich people ignore poor people, and have another round of drinks. So James says to the arrogant, listen, the only answer to all this arrogance and selfishness is conversion, convert, turn around, turn away. All its own character, number one, give up your judgmental attitudes. All its own character, number two, give 
up your arrogant individualism. All odds own character number three, give up your wealth, stop sinning. There's a certain genius to this section in James chapter 4, 11 to 5, 6. When I first read these three sections, I thought they seemed disconnected. But James brings it all together as one in order to dismantle arrogance. And he connects it to his ongoing theme as in his entire epistle, the royal law of Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor Ask yourself. That's where he's going with this. And that's why we, every speaker who's spoken so far has mentioned the royal law, Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor, ask yourself. Now, every time I hear a reference to Leviticus 19, 18, I think of a particular story. Back when John and I were in college, we had a friend. I'll call him Greg. <laughs> Taylor, because that's his real name. <laughs> Greg found a girl he liked. I'll call her Jill Taylor because that's her name. They went on a couple dates. They held hands. Love was in the air. And back in the old days at the Christian college where we were students, if we wanted to show a guy or a girl that we liked them, we sent a letter in campus mail. It probably seems quaint to our college students now. We didn't text or IM each other. We got out this thing called a piece of paper. And we wrote on it with this thing called a pen or pencil, and then we folded it, sometimes two times, sometimes three times, and we put it in this ancient thing called an envelope. So Greg wanted to send Jill a letter. And in his letter, he told her he was enjoying getting to know her. He thought she was great. And in closing the letter, Greg wanted to include a Bible verse about love. He thought he might throw it in like that, you know, still early in the relationship. So he looked through the Bible for just the right verse and landed on Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Perfect, Greg thought. I will write this reference at the bottom of the letter and Jill will go look up Leviticus 19, 18 and she will know this is a love letter. So Greg folded up his letter and mailed it in campus mail. A few days later, Jill opened that letter. Now, I gotta admit, when people send me a Bible verse like that, I don't always go look it up. But Jill's a better person than I am. So she went back to her dorm room and she opened her Bible to Leviticus and she looked for the verse this young man had left for her. Unfortunately, Greg had transcribed the numbers wrong, which happens to be especially dangerous in Leviticus. <laughs> and, he had written from Leviticus 19, 18, 18, 19, sorry, got to get it straight. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. <laughs> this is a true story. Actually, Jill is such a good person. I didn't tell them I was telling this story in advance because I know what good people they are. <laughs> but um, Jill's such a good person. She didn't even tell Greg that he did that until after they had been married. And, and she got it out and showed it to him. I would have been making fun of him like I am now. But Jill waited. And she told him later what he had done. And they just celebrated 25 years of marriage recently. Greg and Jill Taylor. <laughs> Now, despite that funny story, I do think Greg's gut instinct was the right one. When in doubt, go to the heart of the law, keep it simple, rely on God's law. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the point James is making. All the law and the prophets hang on it. We live in a world, however, where loving your neighbors can seem like a complicated command. There are just so many big problems in this world. We live in a world where 17,000 children die every day, mostly from preventable or treatable causes. We live in a world where 2.5 billion 
people lack access to standard sanitation, including one million who are forced to resort to open defecation for lack of other options, bringing sickness and disease to their communities, especially to their children. There's nothing like the funeral of a child. John and I were missionaries in Jinja, Uganda for several years. And there in Uganda, coffins are sold in kiosks on the side of the road. And among all those coffins, there are far too many pre-made, miniature, child-sized coffins just waiting for the one in five children who will not live to see a fifth birthday in Uganda. I hate those coffins. I believe God hates those coffins. We tend to grieve more quietly in the Western world, but Ugandans do not hold back when they grieve. Grief is loud. Death makes noise. So at far too many funerals, we awkwardly learn to cry, the kind of cry that James is talking about, to join in with devastated people burying their children who should not have died. When I close my eyes, I can still hear our friend Ida saying, Regan, 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 for her son who was lost. But these cries do not just come from overseas. In the United States of America, for the first time in 50 years, a majority of public school students come from low-income families and qualify for free and reduced price lunches. The teachers we are training here at Pepperdine University will teach hungry students in their classroom. They will not have noise canceling options if they teach in our public schools. At the southern borders of the United States of America, authorities report having captured 15,647 children, captured children traveling without parents who tried to jump the border in the last six months. The captured children are held in detention centers with 18 foot high fences with razor wire on top. While they are held, the children lie on mattresses on the floor in what look like livestock stalls to me. Go look it up. Inevitably, given the number of people, it smells of feet and it smells of sweat. I don't know what we should ultimately do about immigration. It's obviously complicated. But whatever the complexities are, we live in a world where kids are being caged like animals. And for Christians, there are no noise-canceling options. In the United States of America in 2015, more African-American adults are under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or par parole than were enslaved in 1850. In our country right now, from Ferguson to Tulsa to Baltimore, there is a cry going out that the system is not fair to everyone. Regardless of what you think in terms of media coverage and drug laws and prison reform and the war on drugs, God's children, mothers and fathers and sons and daughters are crying, crying that black lives matter. A young man in Baltimore told his district representative, Elijah Cummings, this week, I feel like I'm in a coffin and I'm kicking and screaming, but no one is coming to help me out. For Christians, there are no noise canceling options. You know, it would be far easier if James did not have to go poking around at controversial, hot-button issues. It would be far easier if he could just say things in a nicer way, a more politically correct way, without offending people and calling them arrogant. I'm not so sure that's the tactic that inspires people, James. If I were James's PR consultant, I would advise him to tone it down a bit. God's people have an arrogance problem he proclaims without apology and the only cure is simple stop clowning around and love your neighbor this 
This is the point in the sermon where I'm supposed to offer an action item or an example of someone who's doing it right. I thought about telling the story of some of the sacrificial Christian people I've known through the years, missionaries and generous philanthropists and families who serve foster children and people who sell their big fancy houses and move to the inner city. These are great examples of what James is calling us to do, but today I wanna tell you about a very average somebody who exemplifies what it means to love our neighbors. Her name was Evelyn Clark. I was at an event for new students at Pepperdine in the fall when I first heard Rick Gibson tell Evelyn's story to incoming students. Evelyn was a founding member of Associated Women of Pepperdine, go by pie, and a member of our board of regents. A lot of you probably knew her. Evelyn passed away several years ago, and although I never met her, when I heard her story, I thought about how she is the antithesis, the opposite of the Olive Zone character. Evelyn was a member of a local congregation which in the 1990s was trying to find creative ways to love their neighbors. They tried some unconventional programs geared toward young people that included theater and music and dancing. Despite the success of the program, some of the senior citizens of the church were nervous about all that theater and dancing and singing and music. The church was called, being called to radically love their young neighbors, young people who didn't know the unspoken rules of the congregation. Rick overheard one woman complaining about something that was new at the time because young people wanted it. She said, I see that we've added a soda machine to the fellowship hall. And she said it like an all its own. There was a challenge in the statement. She continued, if we're punting money in a soda machine in the church building, what's next? Slot machines? <laughs> a crowd of 80-somethings gathered around a table with the complainer. There was muttering about Jesus and the money changers in the temple. They had suspected for some time that the church was being led astray, was heading down a slippery slope, and the soda machine was just the evidence they needed. It's a lot easier to complain about a soda machine than it is to complain about the neighborhood teenagers who like the soda. Everyone at the table was involved in the muttering and complaining except for one, Evelyn Clark nearly a decade older than the rest of them. She said nothing for a while. You barely noticed Evelyn until she stood, and even then, it was hard to see her, for her age was greater than her weight. Suddenly, this tiny woman put a stop to all that muttering and started pounding on the table, shocked. Everyone turned to look at her. They respected Evelyn. She had clout like the modest string of pearls she wore around her neck. Her white hair was perfectly in place. Her dresses were always cleaned and pressed. Evelyn was a well put together 93 year old. What happened next, however, was a complete and total contradiction of the image of this dignified woman. After getting everyone's attention, Evelyn reached up under her chin. You know that part we're all trying to hide? And she grabbed a handful of loose skin and pulled it downward saying, look at this. Everyone gasped. Rick said he was stunned by how far she could pull the skin down. <laughs> but Evelyn wasn't done. She reached for the loose skin under her outstretched arm and pulled it out and said, look at this. Now that she had everyone's attention, <laughs> Evelyn made eye contact with every person staring back at her and said, look at us, we are dying. This is not about us anymore. This church is trying to do something positive in the life of children and young people in the, in the, in the lives of our neighbors. And I, for one, think we should get behind them. This frail superhuman in her pearls and sensible pumps is an image I want you to remember. When we have little left in this life except decaying flesh, may it be said of us that we used it to love our neighbors, that we got behind them, as Evelyn said. <clears throat> that we got behind them instead of getting in their way. Our neighbors are really not all that interested in joining congregations that argue about soda machines or guitars or political candidates. That's not compelling. 
Families are falling apart in our neighborhoods. Children are getting on our school buses with growling stomachs. Violence has taken residence across the street from our church buildings. People in our midst are workaholics and alcoholics and sexaholics. Our neighbors are not really all that interested in whether we're at a progressive congregation or a conservative congregation and whether we can boast about having Sunday services, three Sunday services and multi-site campuses or great brand, bands or new songs or old songs. If we brag about what we do or do not do at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, our neighbors are on to us. They recognize the stock all its own character. When he or she step is in, steps into the scene, they want nothing to do with arrogance. Humility, humanity is crying out for love. And we must be the people who hear them and go to them. Talking about topics like love and arrogance can be vague. So James gives us much more than a simple reminder to love people. James gets in our faces with three very specific ways to convert and stop being arrogant, stop being judgmental, stop acting like we are gods ourselves. We are called to give up our money and our stuff. This is the kind of thing our neighbors are interested in. Humility, tolerance, radical sharing, or to put it more succinctly, love. Evelyn's example to us is that she was more interested in loving her neighbors than she was in maintaining her own preferences. This is what God is calling us to do. Do whatever it takes to love neighbors. Welcome them, see them, hear them, serve them, speak up for them, understand them. Attend to the needs they have, not to the needs we suppose they have. Instead of sitting around and asking, who exactly is my neighbor in the name of God, pick one. <laughs> when we walk onto the stage of our neighborhoods, may our neighbors say of us, I know this character. I can predict what's going to happen next. This is one of the people who loves like God loves. <laughs>